streams in the desert. <laughs> it's funny, I got a, every now and then I get a comment or an email or some type of correspondence. <laughs> Always digital. I prefer it that way. I just don't do phones. And... When I was younger, I've worked all the different phone types of environments you could imagine, from customer service to technical support to you name it. But anyways, I had an email and uh, it was a casual question, or maybe it was a comment. It was a casual question. It simply said, you know, why do you why do you read all those devotionals, or why do you you know record them? And I said, well, have you watched one? <laughs> I said, I pretty much explain it each time, but, you know, if not the case, then perhaps, you know, maybe they'll understand if they see this one. I said, well, I said, if you watch one of those devotionals, you'll realize that I'm more of a sinner than you are, so I need twice as much help. <laughs> and believe it or not, you know, that may sound corny and it may sound like a cliche, but frankly, I know me. And one of the things that you learn when you're a Christian for a long time or you're a believer or you've walked with Jesus is that as you study the word and you see yourself through the light of God's eyes, not only does he love you the way you are, but you also recognize just what a corrupt person you actually are and how wonderful grace is and how it applies so fittingly to our life. Because you can have a doctrine of holiness, you know, beat into you so much so that you think that, you know, you're going to be grounded and founded in, say, like a... a Catholic background where guilt is the primary motivation for 90% of what you do because you feel guilty. You know, you better do it or else, oh my God. You know, and that works for some, I guess. You know, if you know Jesus, it does. But if you don't, I suggest, you know, if you're going to stay in the Catholic Church, check out Charismatic or something. But <laughs> find Jesus because <laughs> you can find everything else there. But, you know, I'm not so sure sometimes that you're finding, you know, the gospel and you know what a personal relationship with God is. But my point being is that. I, when I started this series, had already worked behind the scenes in hundreds, well, maybe not hundreds, that might be an exaggeration, I don't exaggerate, but I've worked in a lot of mega ministries behind the scenes doing the grunt work that needs to be done. Most of the time it was technical, sometimes it was practical, like toilets and, oh, I don't know, setting up things when... Like a missionary, you go into a ministry at the beginning and you need to get it organized. Well, you know, I can think of just about any function in the church that I haven't done, I have done. And it was to help whatever ministry at the time that I was a part of to grow and develop and mature in whatever God was doing with them. Now, it didn't always mean I agreed with them. It just meant that the Lord sent me there. And usually if he sends me, <laughs> it's a case of last resort. <laughs> Believe me. Because I'll up and go, you know, someone asked me, you know, I'll come, oh yeah, watch out, you know, <laughs> I'll put everything, you know, in my backpack and I'm there, and I'll help you if God sends me. And I enjoyed that for 35 years plus of my life, always being behind the scenes and always just doing what it is that, you know, the Lord had had me to do. And then one day he said, write a book, you know, and so I wrote a book, you know, and I enjoyed it, and then I started my series of books, and, you know, I enjoyed that, too. And then, slowly, as he wanted me to kind of step out of the dark shadows of, you know, some of the things that had to go on behind the scenes, he brought me to a place of wanting me to read my devotionals more often, and I don't. So, guess what? This series isn't about you. It's about me. <laughs> You're just along for the ride. You're making me read my devotionals like I used to do. So in a lot of ways, it's a very selfish endeavor. But sometimes, if you've already committed yourself unto the Lord, some of your selfishness really isn't that. It's kind of a mutual experience of knowing God. And that's what fellowship's all about. Having fun with the Lord Jesus. And having Him, because He's inside you, and He's inside me, bind us together. For God hath made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Genesis 41, 52. The summer showers are falling. No, they're not. The summer sun is falling. <laughs> and it's hot. The summer showers are falling. The poet stands by the window watching them. 
They are beating and buffeting the earth with their fierce downpour. But the poet sees in his imaginings more than the showers which are falling before his eyes. He sees myriads of lovely flowers which shall soon be breaking forth from the watered earth, filling it with matchless beauty and fragrance. And so he sings, It isn't raining rain for me, it's raining daffodils. In every dippling drop I see wild flowers upon the hills. A cloud of gray engulfs the day and overwhelms the town. It isn't raining rain for me, it's raining roses down. Perchance, someone of God's chastened children is even now saying, Oh, God. <laughs> don't you just love those aha, you know, what did they say? Oprah invented aha moments? Well, anyways, I don't know. But I like the oh, God, because it could be, Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> you put the enunciation wherever it fits for you. Oh, God, it is raining hard for me tonight. Testings are raining upon me which seem beyond my power to endure. Disappointments are raining fast to the utter defeat of all my chosen plans. Bereavements are raining into my life which are making my shrinking heart quiver in its intensity of suffering. The rain of affliction is surely beating down upon my soul these days. With all, friend, you are mistaken. It isn't raining rain for you. It's raining blessing. <laughs> yeah, right. Tell them that when they're suffering. Just kidding. For if you will but believe your father's word, under that beating rain are springing up spiritual flowers of such fragrance and beauty as never before grew in that stormless, unchastened life of yours. You indeed see the rain, but do you also see the flowers? You are pained by the testings, but God sees the sweet flower of faith which is upspringing in your life under those very trials. You shrink from the suffering, but God sees the tender compassion for others which is finding birth in your soul. Your heart winces under the sore bereavement, but God sees the deepening and enriching which that sorrow has brought to you. It isn't raining afflictions for you. It is raining tenderness, love, compassion, patience, and a thousand other flowers and fruits of the blessed spirit which are bringing into your life such a spiritual enrichment as all the fullness of worldly prosperity and ease was never again to beget in your innermost soul. You know... I don't talk too much about it because I went through it and shared it at the time and did it, but, you know, one of the, <laughs> one of the blessings and curses that happened to me when I got saved was that I got saved with such a phenomenal, miraculous, you know, empowerment, if you want to say that, or such a overwhelming experience that most people, you know, are jealous about that they don't see the other side that happened for the next 10 years after that, was that... When I got saved, I, you know, was just like everyone else in the Jesus movement, Jesus freakish days where my eyes were open, I could see things differently, I had supernatural knowledge, I had gifts of spirit, and blah, 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 and the weirdest thing was that not knowing anything, all of a sudden I knew things, and did things that, you know, even to this day are marvelous, and people love to hear those stories. But then, you know, a little while longer, you know, about 40 days, approximate, I went to a prayer meeting, and then even worse, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, and even that was more marvelous and beyond my comprehension and understanding and blah, blah, blah. But then, not long after that, before oh, much time had gone, I had already signed up for the Marine Corps. And when I went in the Marine Corps, it was a whole different experience. While I was there, an incurable disease afflicted me. I wound up spending the next 10 years of my life in and out of hospitals up and down the West Coast. I could tell you just about where every VA hospital is on the West Coast because I've been there. I could tell you quite a few stories about what surgery is like and where experimentation in VA hospitals happened in those days because sometimes when they didn't know what they were doing, they did the best that they could. And sometimes that was at the price of what the patients endured. And I know because I had to get into the medicine field in order to survive those days because God led me to a unique experience through all of that. He taught me what suffering is because I didn't question anything I still had my Bible I still had my Strong's Concordance right there in my hospital bed but I also had the IV that was in the central line in my heart I also had another IV in my arm that was pumping in intralipid fluids so that I could go from 60 pounds to 70 pounds to 80 pounds you can't live that low weight so that's why they did experimentation and thank God at that time you know it worked so some of the things that they did were wonderful, and thank God for doctors, and some of the things that they did were sad. And in each case and every one of them, streams in the desert, 
kept me alive in some ways. And God filled in the rest. So if you think that you've ever suffered or that, you know, you see some saint that, you know, is goofy and giggly and, you know, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what I am. I'm kind of a nut sometimes and sometimes I'm not. You know, the old commercial. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you're not. Well, when you walked with Jesus for a long time, you recognize that even in the suffering, you can have joy. Even in the trials and tribulations, they are to meant to bring to you a place of one day bearing much fruit. And my life, as a testimony to God, has shown that not only does grace endure, but suffering has a purpose in a person's life. And it can bring forth not just tenderness and experience to relate to others, but it can also produce in you the wisdom to be able to see past what the person may be telling you to touch the tender heart of God who wants to reach out to you and let you know you are loved in the midst of your suffering. And can I say that God was there? After the fact, yes. Before the fact and during, no. Because at times, you feel like you want to end your life. I've been there. And you know what? God can keep you from falling. He presents you faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. And He will. Because there's a reason why you're going through suffering now. There's a reason why you're enduring it. And there's a reason why you will not die but declare the glorious works of God. If he's given you that scripture, hang in there. It will get better. For me, hey, I'm looking forward to death. I think it's going to be a wonderful experience. <laughs> oh.